Well, good evening. It's good to see you all here. And welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, um, it's good to be able to read his word and, and to look into it and to, to uh, see what God wants of us and, and uh, help us to have our eyes on him. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 22 and 23 today, tonight. Paul, Paul, when he's on his missionary journeys and uh, through and through, he wanted to please the Lord. And after he came to know the Lord as his saviour, he wanted others to as well. And Paul, he didn't only preach when things were going well in his way. He didn't only speak to people when he thought that they would accept what he had to say but he continued to preach even when others may have been against him because he wanted so much for them to know the truth about our Lord and Saviour. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Apostle Paul, who, Lord, who was an apostle uh, to the Gentiles. Lord, he was somebody who, who said he was an apostle born out of due time. Uh, Lord, he met Christ face to face, as it were, uh, on his road to Damascus, where, uh, Lord, he, he understood then who Christ really was. Lord, knowing the, the Old Testament law back to front, he was a man who was able to, um, to just claim, Lord, many things, but without knowing the Saviour, that was misguided, but as soon as he knew the Saviour, those things made a lot of sense. We thank you, Lord, that the resurrection of Christ is our strength. And Lord, we thank you that we know that when you raised him from the dead, it shows us also that you have power to raise us again at that last day. We thank you and praise you for this. We pray, Lord, that you might see fit to use us to glorify your name. Lord, to share the gospel of Christ with other people. We pray, Lord, that you might help us to be able to um, just share in such a way that, uh, Lord, would bring glory to your name and, Lord, that others might be drawn unto you. Help us to lift Christ high. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 22 is sort of where I'm starting, but I'm just going to go back into chapter 21 briefly uh, to pick up where we last left off. And in chapter 21, if we looked at verse 26, we'll see there, or uh, verse 27 will we'll be fine. Uh, and when the, day, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. So we understand here that Paul had people grab hold of him because of his uh, entering into the temple. Now I want you to see here how they got some things a bit mistaken even uh, as they got riled up. They started crying out in verse 28, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against this people, against the people and, and the law and this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Okay, They thought that he'd taken some Greeks into the temple. And uh, the, the Jews only wanted Jews in the temple they're very patriotic. You'll see this. Um, and verse 31 tells us, and they went, as they went about to kill him, okay, they weren't only going to rough him up. They were going to give him his fair share and more. They were going to kill him. But as this happened, it says here in verse 31, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. And to finish off the rest of the chapter, the um, <clears throat> those... The captains came down, the captain of the band and the chief men came down and saved Paul out of the people's hands. And when they saw the captain there, they left off beating him 
and so on. So, and you get uh, down to verse the last part of it, and Paul asked if he could speak with the people. So chapter 22 is about his defence before the people. Chapter 22, verse 1, Men, brethren and fathers, this is Paul speaking, <clears throat> hear ye my defence which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue, tongue to them, they kept the more silence. That's interesting, isn't it? You notice, I want to just point out to you how patriotic the Jews are. They liked the Jewish religion to be the one and only one. And anyone who opposed that, they were in trouble. Here, you notice when they heard that he um, spoke to them in the Hebrew tongue, they kept the more silence. It's like you could hear a pin drop. Oh, this guy can really... Okay, he brought the Greeks into the temple, but oh, he speaks in our language. Okay, he, he, uh, this is the Hebrew tongue that he's talking to us in. So he continues on and in his defence... He tells a little bit about his former life before he became a Christian. He says, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this, in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. Oh, that's one tick for all of them. Gamaliel was a very well-known teacher of the time and Paul was taught under this fellow who was the greatest of teachers taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God. Another tick, okay? He was a zealot, you could call it. He wanted to do what God said to do in the law, right? And he, he tells them, as ye all are this day. So he's acknowledging that they also are zealous toward God. Another tick for them. And I, also, I, I persecuted this way unto the death binding and delivering into prison both men and women. Ooh, that's pretty nasty. But he's saying, I used to do what you're doing to me. He's telling them that, right? As also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders. So that would probably make them stop and consider, what are they doing? This guy's on our side. He's doing the same thing. You continue down... Um, he tells about his trip to Damascus where there was a great light and he was speechless and he fell to his knees and there was a voice from heaven. And verse 10, And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus and there it shall be told thee of all the things which are appointed for thee to do. And he says, And when I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came to, into Damascus. So he was blind, led of the hand. He's telling the people this story. And this is a, like a story to make people spellbound. It's like, wow, okay, this is quite something traumatic, you could just about say, that happened to Paul or Saul as it was when, um, at the time. And he tells about Ananias who was told to, to go to Damascus and lay his hands on this certain man, Saul, and how the, Ananias said, but Lord, I've heard of many of this man and uh, he goes about killing people and uh, I don't want to do it, Lord. Have you ever been in that state? The Lord wants you to do something. And you say, oh, no, Lord, it's too hard. Okay, uh, sometimes it can be, but um, the Lord assured Ananias it was his will. You need to go there because I've chosen this man to do a work for me. So Ananias did. Now, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, we'll go fast forward. To verse 15, 16. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Whoa. Okay. Doesn't that sound like you've got to be baptized in order to be saved? That's exactly what it sounds like. So, so do we hold to baptismal regeneration? Of course not. Let's, let's actually go back and look at Acts chapter 9 at the actual incidents when this happened. So I'll see a little bit clearer what he's talking about and why he says it this way. Uh, Acts 9, 9 to 17. <clears throat> All 
right. Acts 9 and verse 9. And he was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Now, just we're going to pause in this little spot and just mention here uh, in Proverbs 29, I might look this up, Proverbs 29, 25. We'll come back here in just a, uh, in a few seconds. Proverbs 29 and 25. something that we all need to remember. It says there, Proverbs 29, 25, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Right. Does it mean safe from physical abuse? No, it doesn't. But it means we'll be safe in the hands of the Lord, by the way. But, I want you to know that the fear of man brings a snare. If we allow the fear of man to overcome us so that we're not doing the will of God, it's going to cause somebody some big grief. Okay, so we need to make sure that we remember that just because we're frightened of doing something doesn't mean there's not God's will for us to go ahead and do it. We need to remember that that's, um, that's going to be a temptation because we have a tendency to focus on the problem rather than the problem solver. Okay, We need to remember to fear God. So this man, Ananias, yes, he did have a certain fear, and he realised that this man has done much evil, Saul has, to the, saint, the saints at Jerusalem. Verse, uh, back in Acts 9.14, and here he had the authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. He'd heard about Saul's plan to come and capture those at Damascus and take them bound and even to kill them. Verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Understand this? God said he was going to show Paul how great things he must suffer for God's name's sake. So Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptised. Okay, did you know that he was filled with the Holy Ghost in verse 17 before he arose and was baptised in verse 18? But it all happened simultaneously at the same time. He obviously understood the things of God, how the, who, who Christ really was, that he is the saviour of the world. He's not some... A uh, person who's just made himself to be a religious leader and making himself the king of the Jews, but rather he is the Christ who he said he was. So when those things were understood, he obviously understood that Christ was truly resurrected and that he was serving a resurrected Lord. And so knowing the risen Christ, the Bible says in verse 30, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. He didn't go to a Bible college. Did you know that you don't have to wait till you know everything there is or go to a Bible college before you can preach the Word of God? Rather, you can teach others that Christ, the one who saved you, can save others too and can save the people you're talking to. Okay, You can teach what you know. There's, there's other incidences in the Bible of uh, people who were 
blind who Jesus made to see. And these people, they just went out and told what happened. They didn't have to know it all. Okay, you don't have to know it all. Not that I'm, I'm saying don't learn so that you can help others with different issues that they've got or hold-ups. But um, we don't have to know it all before we're able to speak what we know Christ has done for us. Okay. <clears throat> so there, the baptism was straight after he had trusted the Lord. It was all simultaneous, same time. Okay, back to chapter 22, Acts 22. I've got a bundle of other verses for that there, but we won't go into that for the sake of time. Okay, so he called upon the name of the Lord. It wasn't the baptism that washed away his sins. It was coming to Christ that washed away his sins. He was baptised at the same time. And by the way, baptism, why did they baptise straight away? We tend to leave it for months or years before a person's baptised sometimes. Why did they do it straight away? I tend to think it was because people had seen who Christ really is. They've accepted the Lord, the the Saviour of the world, uh, into their hearts and their life. They understand that Christ is the one who paid their penalty. So they want others to know. They want to be joined in all that is taught from God's Word. And they got baptised. And that was a common thing that they straight away were baptised throughout the early church there. Verse 17, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste. This is still talking about the time when he's at Damascus, and uh, just straight after then, he's still relaying his message. Um, before the people who were going to kill him. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned the beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. I think Paul then thought he was sort of above that. And um, he thought maybe that they would listen to his testimony and understand uh, where he's at and not continue to beat him. I'm not really sure that. And I said in verse 19, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. That's when Stephen died. By the way, do you ever consider, uh, the Bible says that um, when, when we please the Lord, then he'll make even our enemies to be at peace with him, when our ways please the Lord. Yet when you look at Stephen, his ways definitely please the Lord. And what happened? Was he, were his enemies at peace with him? It's not necessarily the case, is it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But Stephen stood a faithful martyr And because of his testimony, I believe that really cut to Paul. And Paul ended up coming to the Lord, I believe, through the testimony of Stephen. So he kept the raiment of them that slew him. And in verse 21, he continues and says, And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Wow. Wow. Now, as soon as he said that word Gentile, have a guess what happened. Again, remember how patriotic they are? You know, one time, Heather and myself, we were we drove around uh, in, we were going to go around Australia. We stopped a little while in Victoria. We were setting up the vehicle a little bit better before we continued on. And then we went to South Australia and... In Melbourne, this car came in, just yelled out some things, and he was going to run me off the road. And I was, oh, oh, oh. You know, and I was thinking, what on earth? Then it wasn't too much longer down the road, still in Melbourne, 
And this guy winds down his windows and he runs at me like this and says, what are you smiling at? And he took a dive at my car and I'm, whoa, <laughs> again. So I relate it to somebody a bit later on and they says, well, yeah, now it's footy season. Uh, what's, what number plates are on your car? And I said, oh, well, when we were in Victoria, we uh, changed it to Victorian because it was like running out of rego and because we weren't going to be back in Sydney for 12 months. We, and that's where I was based at. We decided to get it Victorian rego since it was half the price. And so uh, I said, that's why, because uh, Victoria and South Australia, they rival with the footy teams. And it was right on, on the, at the time of the um, big games. And I thought, wow, that's a bit too head crazy, top heavy for, for me. But you know, when people believe a certain thing and hold a certain thing, they'll do some pretty nasty things. And sometimes you'll get a gang that will rile up really quickly. And that's what happened to Paul here. But here, as soon as he mentioned that, um, that Jesus told him, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Look in verse 22, and they gave him audience unto this word. And then lifted up their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for it's not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a, a Roman and uncondemned? I just want to stop and pause and mention here, it's not wrong to use the law. Some people have got the idea that we shouldn't go to the law against the unjust. The law is there for a protection and is there for a purpose. And we need to use the law lawfully. It's not wrong to use the law lawfully. And that's exactly what he's doing here. <clears throat> so he says, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? Because it's not lawful for anybody to scourge a Roman who's been uncondemned. It's not even lawful for them to bind them, which they'd already done. Okay. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. And it came a lot of privileges with being a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, yea. And the chief captain answered, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, but I was free born. He didn't need to buy this privilege. He was born into that privilege. And then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty, wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. So you can see that it was a huge uh, thing that was going against Paul. All the people were binding him, going to kill him until the chief captain came and um, rescued Paul from among them. Now, Paul is there at the council again and his defence is going to uh, be in front of the the rulers this time. <clears throat> so chapter 23, Paul and Paul earnestly beholding the council said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. And high priest Annas commanded them that stood by, by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whitest wall, whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. He said some things that were very true, but he didn't realise he was the high priest. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So here Paul basically gave an apology because he was overstepping the mark. So notice that even in the court, if you were to be put in front of court, it's not a position for you to say, I know the law and I'm to stand here. 
so uh, I know my position, I know I'm in the right and so on and, and make accusation in a nasty way, you ought to still be peaceable. You ought to still be uh, not just making nasty comments of those who are doing it to you. It's a, a pretty interesting way that, that uh, Paul's backing down a bit there. But it was he obviously didn't know that this was the high priest. <clears throat> so then, then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part was Sadducees and the other part, the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. All right, so here, <clears throat> he's, um, he's actually making a dissension between two parties that are there. He's speaking to the council, but also the people are still around there. And he's seeing that part of them are Pharisees and part of them are Sadducees. One, the Pharisees believe in the resurrection, the Sadducees don't. So he's making a dissension between them. <clears throat> and when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Wouldn't you think, wow, that's enough opposition for one day? It's full on. Well, it's probably over a couple of days there so far. But here, Paul's had a lot of people against him. And it's not just like somebody threw a rotten egg at him. This is full on. People were crying out to kill him, away from him, away with this man, for it's not, he's not fit to live. Okay, People were crying out some evil remarks, some horrible remarks toward him. What do you do when persecution arises? By the way, did you notice the, the answer that he gave? Did you say, well, that's a pretty clever uh, answer before two, there's sort of two groups here and he's sort of just picked on one thing and, and mentioned that to everyone so that they're fighting amongst each other, which again shows that these people are riled up very quickly and very easily. They don't even know what Paul's being held in question for. <clears throat> Okay, so verse 10, And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. You know what he didn't do? You know what God didn't do? God didn't tell him, I'll take you away out of the persecution. He didn't say that. He said, keep up the good work, Paul. I've got more for you to do. Now, at that time, I wonder if Paul thought, well, that means if I'm going to be preaching at Rome, then God's going to make me so I'm free again. Could have thought that. Don't know. But he wasn't about to give up just because of persecution. How many of us would back up when somebody starts to speak evil of us or we'd stop talking? <clears throat> so he wants, to be a, wants him to be a witness also at Rome. Can we just turn back a chapter to verse, chapter 22 and verse 20. I'll just read a verse there. See, Paul wasn't about to give up because he knew what he put other th people through as well. And when the blood of the, thy martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by and consenting unto his death. 
and kept the raiment of them that slew him. That's probably largely a thing that played on Paul's mind. He knew what he'd done to others and he knew what these other people were doing and why. He understood also who the resurrected Christ was. So he sought the more to win them for Christ. Okay, 23, 12. And when it was day, <clears throat> certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Look up here, please. Some of you don't think there's such thing as a conspiracy. There is such thing as conspiracy. In fact, conspiracy has been around probably since man was on the earth. Uh, conspiracies well, maybe not quite then, but not, sh not long after. Conspiracy was a part of the kings. And I'll, um, I'd like you to look up. I do have a, a verse here. And I think it's in Kings, but I'm just trying to look for it. All right, 1 Kings 15, 22. If we can just look up there quickly. 1 Kings 15. Through the kings of Israel, just an example of one here. Chapter 15, verse 22. Then King Azza made a proclamation throughout all Judah. None was exempted, and they took away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha, or Baasha, had builded. And King Azza built with them Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah, and I missed out the right verse. Okay. I was going to look up a verse, and it was to do with Baasha, actually conspiring against his master, okay, which he did and slew him. And I wanted to tell you, without going through all the references, there was many a time when there was kings that conspired against somebody uh, to kill them. There was Baasha. There was also another king in Israel, Zimri, who uh, took the kingdom. There was also a man named Jehu conspired against his master and slew him, but he was actually, um, he was very proud of it. And he... he um, mentioned at one time, well, I conspired against my master and slew him, but slew, who, who slew all of these? Because there was a whole other group of people who were slain. There was also Shalom who slew his master. There was Pekah who slew his master. There was the servants of Ammon who slew him. There was Elah who, was, uh, who slew his master. There was lots of people. There was um, Hoshea who slew his master. There was lots of illustrations of people conspiring against another person or another group of people uh, in the scriptures. There was also uh, some other things that were mentioned and even more importantly for us to look at uh, the conspiracy, um, how Israel was talked about as conspiring against the Lord. Well, how's that? Let's stop and have a look at that one. Jeremiah 11, 9. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 9. How can Israel conspire against the Lord? And the Lord said unto me, in, sorry, Jeremiah 11, 9, And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them, the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Right. Israel made a covenant with the, uh, their fathers. Sorry. Um, sorry. God made a covenant with the fathers of Israel is better. And here they were to keep certain laws which they had forsaken. They'd gone away from them. So here... Jeremiah is telling them they're turned back to these iniquities. There's conspiracy found amongst them. We need to be careful that we don't conspire in our hearts against the Lord to turn away from his word. 
It's an easy thing to do, to want to follow what the flesh wants. That's conspiracy against the Lord, and we don't want that. Conspiracy is a real thing. We need to recognise that throughout history there is conspiracy, and there is conspiracy theorists. I would suggest to you, don't be a conspiracy theorist, but rather check out what you hear of and go and do some research and understand what you're talking about. And if it is conspiracy, you can warn people about that. There's no problem with that whatsoever. But if it's um, just hearsay, be careful what you hear because lots of things can be said. But let's not... Let's, above all, make sure that we're not conspiring in our hearts against the Lord. Even some, sometimes we might want to twist Scripture a little bit so that we're comfortable. No, wrong way. Better to stay on the side of safety if you're unsure about something in the Scripture, what it's talking about. Err on the side of caution. We could continue, but we'll stop there with that one. We'll, there's another Old Testament verse here. Um, Now we'll continue on. Uh, sorry, back to Acts 22, 23. Acts 23, verse 13. <clears throat> verse 12, these 40 men were there. They bound themselves under a curse, saying we won't eat or drink till they kill Paul. Verse 13, and there were more than 40 which made this conspiracy. And that's quite a few people, and especially when it's at the drop of a hat. 40 men. They wouldn't eat or drink till they saw Paul killed. That's quite a thing to make an oath, put yourself under that oath. Can you imagine it if it was against you because you'd spoken up for the Lord? You want to backpedal, you'd want to hide, but you can't. You're in front of them all. What do you do in such a spot? What do you do? Sorry, there was another... A verse in the Old Testament is Ezekiel 22.25. We'll look at it. Ezekiel 22.25. And it says... There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widow. Sorry, you know, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my va- my law, and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. They have. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. That's a sad picture, isn't it? That's when the people of God have forsaken his ways to that point that they're making merchandise of God's people and they're they're seeking uh, their own wealth and they're not preaching the truth but falsehood. And they put no difference between the holy and the profane. Isn't that a picture of many of churches today? Isn't that a picture of our law system today? To mix up the holy and the profane? Um, it's, it's a sad thing. It's a very sad thing. There's something else that we'll look at. <clears throat> You know, um, there's other conspiracies mentioned. There's Sambalat and Tobiah was against Nehemiah. This time, these guys were the ones who were conspiring against Nehemiah. And it was a hard thing for Nehemiah to battle against these guys, but he continued on to do what he knew to do because he feared God more than man. There's another one also in Amos, and we'll look at this one, Amos 7.10. Can everyone turn there, please? Amos 7.10 in this conspiracy. This is a different sort of a conspiracy altogether. Amos 7.10. The tides have turned. 
Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos have conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. You know what's happening there? Amos is actually preaching the word of God. He's saying the truth and he's pleading with the people to repent, to turn to God. Otherwise, this foreign king will come and destroy him. And yet, the people are saying, this Amos here, the land's not able to bear his words. He's conspiring against you, king, to say to put your arms down and give up. That was the word of God. You know, sometimes there will be people that will call you the conspirator, <laughs> the one who conspires against them because you're not doing what the government says or whatever it might be. And we'll call you the conspirator because you want to stand for the things of God. What do you do? What do you do? You stand for the Lord, not for man. The fear of man brings a snare. You do what God wants you to do. <clears throat> With this uh, division that Paul caused before, did he have pre-organised thoughts in his mind? What do you do when people are against you and want to persecute you? What sort of a thing do you do? Look, look please to Matthew 10, 19 and 20. Matthew 10. Should we be pre-thinking something that we should answer or say in case that we're caught and hauled before somebody else? What did Paul do? Was it preconceived? Was it something he thought up already? I don't believe so. So, it's uh, Matthew 10, verses 19 and 20. It says, but when they deliver you up, and by the way, you notice it doesn't say, but if. <laughs> um, the Bible also teaches us they who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Sometime in your life, if you want to live for Christ, you will suffer persecution. Okay? It's not an if. But when they deliver you up, in verse 19, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. It doesn't need to be premeditated. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Now look at verse 28. <clears throat> it says there, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's quite something, isn't it? We've got to remember, fear God. Why? Because God is the judge of all of the earth. He is righteous and perfect and holy without sin. And when we understand a little bit of a glimpse of his, his, the beauty of his holiness, we can understand a little bit more of our sin and the ugliness of it and how that no way in the world can we, as we are, enter a perfect and holy heaven and it stay holy. Therefore, our sin must be judged by a holy God in order for us to enter heaven. But in God's mercy, he came down in the form of the man Jesus Christ so that he could take your punishment upon his own flesh and die in your place and in my place. That's what he's done. When we understand this, when we understand the righteousness and the perfection, the holiness of God, we can understand a little bit of our sin and how ugly it is because we've all fallen so far short of God's standard. But where to fear this righteous God? Not the people who are just able to kill our body. What is that? Look at verse 32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, 
him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Isn't that a beautiful promise? He wants us to confess him before men, no matter what it takes. And sometimes that will incur being persecuted, whether it be somebody spitting at you or whether it be worse than that. There'll be some degree of persecution. <clears throat> so, because then it says in verses 19 and 20, don't premeditate what your answer is going to be, is that an excuse so we don't have to search out God's word for the truth because God will just help us to know what to say when somebody comes along? No, it also tells us the way to study to show thyselves approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to know God's word so that we need to study out certain things to know where we stand on certain issues. And we can also be a, uh, more of a help to other people. So, um, yeah, there's no problem with studying out and learning the word of God and answer according to scripture. So, with God's encouragement, did he take Paul out of the fire? No. Did he take Stephen out of the fire? No. Just because we choose Christ and his way, does that mean our enemies go away? Uh, because he makes our, um, even our enemies to be at peace with us? Not always. Sometimes, yes. Is there conspiracies? There's conspiracies all around us all the time to varying degrees. But make sure you, make sure you search it out. Yes, I believe there's a big conspiracy today. You may not hold to that, and I know there's certain who don't here. Um, but uh, with, with the coronavirus and, and with, the, um, with the vaccinations, I believe the coronavirus had nothing to do with deaths, etc., more than any other time. But I believe it was a way to get people vaccinated. A couple of people I know of that um, they say that they can test whether you're vac uh, vaccinated or not uh, with a, a phone app. Now, uh, they, one of them says that he can go into a shopping centre and it'll be page loads of numbers that come up and uh, he can, uh, if there's three people that come to him, he can tell whether they're vaccinated or not. If there's six who've been vaccinated and he, and sorry, Six people who come to him, three have been vaccinated. He says he can't tell which one's which, but um, he reckons that they'll have the technology. I have no idea, but uh, that's what he claims. And uh, these things, the vaccinations, um, I, I don't believe that they are the mark of the beast because in order for the mark of the beast, what does the Bible say about it? You need to what? worship the beast, whether that is accepting all that he has to offer or whether that is falling down on your knees, I don't know. But uh, when, uh, that would be a requirement of receiving the mark either on the right hand or the forehead. There's one lady who told me that what's the stuff that they're putting into you with the vaccinations, that she was told by a nurse that uh, that stuff actually congregates in your body. I don't know to where or to what purpose. I'm also told several years ago that on your right hand and forehead is a warmer spot than the rest of your body. Uh, whether it congregates there, I have no idea. I, I think that uh, whether that's far-fetched or not, I have no idea. These are some things that are put out there. But at the same time, the, uh, the mark of the beast is something you don't want to be getting because the mark of the beast means that you worship the beast and that is meaning that you have opposed the truth. I believe that this is the reason why God basically gives you a ticket to hell when you receive the mark of the beast because it says that he will send strong delusion like this is for the people who have received the mark of the beast, he'll, they'll, 
that God will send them strong delusion so that they will believe a lie because they receive not the love of the truth. They've rejected truth, so they've believed a lie. They've worshipped the beast. And so basically it's a ticket to hell. Okay? So, but I believe that the coming of the Lord, I believe the Scriptures uh, are teaching that the coming of the Lord will be before this seven-year period of which the mark of the beast will be halfway through. So knowing the Lord as your saviour, knowing your sins are forgiven is the key to know that, that Christ has paid for your sin and that you're going to um, live eternally in heaven because without this assurance, there's a lot of dark areas that you're heading in for. Christ has paid for the sin of the world so we can escape the biggest judgment of all that's hellfire. Okay, hell is a place where no one wants to go. No one in their right mind. Hell is a place of fiery torments, a place where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. It's a place where those many who, who are religious will be cast into the lake of fire. Lord, I've done this in your name and I've done that in your name. You know what the difference between religion and Christianity is? Religion is doing for doing things in order to appease God. Christianity, true Christianity, is Christ has done it all and he offers you his free gift. All you've got to do is accept it. It's not a matter of doing anything. It's accepting the gift that's given through Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why then was the conspiracy theorist coined? I believe that term was coined. To stop truth being seen. It's to make people scared of speaking out about such things. But make sure you're not a theorist. Do some research on the topic. Do your study to find out if it's true. But then again, the biggest mistake is many people of this world are accepting that they're good enough to get to heaven. I tell you, do your research. Understand that the goodness that we can produce is as filthy rags before God. He says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. I believe this is the biggest conspiracy of the devil that we can be good enough to enter heaven. Understand that there is only one God who is righteous above all things and holy and our wickedness is far worse than what you dare to imagine. The best we can do is as filthy rags. Are you ready to meet your saviour? Are you ready to meet your maker? Because if you're on the wrong side of that, Hellfire is for eternity, but so is heaven for eternity. But where are you going to end up? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you that your word gives us the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Lord, above all, the greatest conspiracy is that of just being able to earn our salvation in one way or another. Some people are trusting in religion. Some people are trusting in, in their paying money to the church. Some for their baptism. Some for, for just righteous works, Lord. Giving money to charity organisations. They think they're pretty good for it. But Lord, we know that this doesn't take away our sin. And Lord, if we're honest with ourselves, we have sinned against you, a holy God. Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of people, that, Lord, they might understand their wickedness before you, a great and holy God. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be able to warn the wicked of their way that they might return unto you and to simply confess to you and accept the Saviour, his payment on our behalf. We pray, Lord, that you'd use us throughout this week, and those who've been spoken to about you, Lord, that you continue to work in their hearts to bring them to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.